Sajanuranjana Jamuna Tiravana Chadi Jamuna Tiravana Chadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kanjabi Hadi Madhava Kanjabi Hadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kanjabi Hadi His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Sri Prabhupada Ki, Ananta Koti Vaishnavarinda Ki, Korkananda. Wow. There's a little time lag between speaking and. Okay. Because this is a continuation of a whole series, and some of the people, maybe some of you, have not been part of the series, it's probably a good idea to go back and do a little background of how we got to where we are. Yeah? And then we'll carry on. We're, we've been discussing two chapters from uh, Canto 10, Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna's pastimes. And it's Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, chapters 13 and 14. And chapter 14 is where we are now. It's, it's the prayers of Brahma to Krishna. And it covers 40 verses. There's another 20 at the end of the chapter, what happens after he finishes his prayers. But the, the, the circumstance of his offering prayers is um, in the morning, the cowherd boys go out to the forest to herd the cows. There's a whole scene. Krishna is departing. Mother Jasoda can't let Krishna go, but she has to let Krishna go, but she can't let Krishna go because of an affection for Krishna. Finally, he goes. And off they go, and they're playing, and not really herding cows, they're just playing. They're doing what boys like to do, and the cows follow along because they have attachment from Krishna. That's what herding the cows is like. And then as they're going along in that morning, on the path, they see a giant cave. And they think, let's go explore the cave. And they get closer to the cave, and it's not a cave. It's a big serpent lying in the road. And they think, let's go explore the inside of the serpent. And you go off into the serpent. And the purpose of the serpent, the Agasura demon, is to kill Krishna. He was sent by Kamsa, and he has the capacity to assume different forms, so he assumed that form. So, long story short, Krishna enters into the mouth of the Agasura demon. He closes his mouth and Krishna expands his body. One of his mystic powers is he can become bigger than the biggest. So the body of the serpent also expands, but eventually he can't expand far enough, fast enough, and he leaves his body, suffocates. And the soul of Agasura goes up into the air, leaving his skull or the top part of his head. Krishna leaves the serpent along with the cowherd boys and the soul of Agasura hovers in the air and shh, merges into Krishna's body. And the cowherd boys go, wow, that was really good. Let's go have lunch. So they go sit and have lunch. And um, 
Brahma happened to visit Krishna at that very time. He saw the whole thing, and he was thinking, "What's the limit of Krishna's potencies? He looked like a little boy. He's sitting there having lunch with his coward friends. I have mystic potencies. Let me see if I can extend my mystic potencies and see what Krishna does to show his mystic potencies." This is chapter thirteen. So. He takes the calves. Krishna goes to look for the calves. He comes back and steals the coward boys, puts them both in a cave, comes back to see what Krishna is going to do. And what Krishna does, he shows all the calves and coward boys. And he thinks, what happened? So he goes back to the cave. They're in the cave. He goes back and they're sitting having lunch. And then the coward boys that are sitting have a lunch. Each one of them manifests forms of Narayan, and each of the forms of Narayan is surrounded by the personified Vedas and his different potencies and all living entities in a big glorification concert of singing the glories of Krishna, of Narayan. And then he shows all the universes, I mean, multiple universes. Imagine seeing multiple universes. It's more than what Arjuna saw all at once. And then, poof, they all disappeared. What was left was Krishna smiling with unblinking eyes, looking at Brahma, holding some yogurt and rice in his hand. And Brahma offered obeisances again and again, was overwhelmed, and then offered his prayers. So his prayers are very significant. He's, he has many functions. One of them is he's the original receiver of the Vedas because he's the first person. Our Bhagavatam teaches Tene Brahma Hridaya Adikavaye. He's the original learned person, Adikavi, and he received the knowledge of the Vedas from within his heart. There's more details, but he receives and he gives the Vedas. can't stretch to understand transcendence. Bhakti alone can achieve that. Uh, he, he expresses great humility. I was impudent, testing my powers against your powers. Shame on me. And uh, But you've been very kind even to a shameful person like me. You've shown something that's most extraordinary. And then goes on to describe in a whole series of prayers, essentially uh, the absolute truth from the, the Vedic perspective or Vedanta Sutra, the absolute truth is that from which everything comes. That is to say, everything else is a relative truth resting upon that from which it comes, the absolute truth. So in various ways, he describes Krishna as the absolute truth source of all avatars, the source of all universes, the source of all living entities, the source of his power to know anything, to create, to, to, etc. And then there's a section that we're in, in the midst of now where he, um, our acharyas say he plunges into an ocean of Braja Prem. He starts glorifying the great fortune of the residents of Braja because they have they have constant association with Krishna because they're like Krishna their forms are all spiritual they have spiritual senses and so they can see and understand Krishna not by speculative powers but by their power of devotion and he goes on in various ways describing
Vasis, the residents, the Dham, the process of bhakti. And then the, yesterday we spent a whole day just discussing one verse, text 33, where um, Brahma is saying that these most fortunate residents of Vrindavan have also given some of their fortune to us. They've empowered us, the 11 controlling deities of the senses. So we discussed the whole, not the whole, but how that fits into the Sankhya philosophy system, giving rise to the universal form, etc. The bridge bhasis empower through their senses, us, these 11 presiding deities of the senses, to um, experience Krishna. Through their senses, we can experience Krishna. They've given us that empowerment, that mercy. So those most fortunate souls have made us also fortunate in that way. Because otherwise we, the demigods, the residing deities of the senses, don't have the capacity. Our senses are material. And material senses can't perceive the sweetness of Krishna. The residents of Vrindavan can experience, without our help, and they're being merciful to us. So that's where we ended. Text 33. Audio problem? So what do we do? Just pause? Okay. Well, at least for those of you that are not familiar with the story, now you're up to speed. You know the story. Too many wires. Should I speak so you can see if it's being broadcast? power in the outlet or something I don't don't I don't don't bother to explain I don't <laughs> should I go go oh, ahead hey. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So this is text 34 from Canto 10, Chapter 14 where Brahma is speaking, offering prayers to Krishna. My greatest possible good fortune would be 
to take birth, whatever in this forest of Gokula, and have my head bathed by the dust falling from the lotus feet of any of its residents. Their entire life and soul is the Supreme Personality of Godhead Mukunda, the dust of whose lotus feet is still being searched for in the Vedic mantras. I'm going to read the purport and then uh, some of the commentary of our Acharyas. It's very nice. This verse indicates that Brahma desires to take birth even as the smallest blade of grass in Vrindavan so that the holy residents of the Lord's abode may walk upon his head and bless him with the dust of their feet. Being realistic, Lord Brahma does not aspire to directly achieve the dust of Lord Krishna's feet. Rather, he aspires the mercy of the Lord's devotees. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains that Brahma is willing to take birth even as a stone in the paved, in a paved footpath in the Lord's abode. Since Brahma is the creator of the entire universe, we can just imagine how glorious is the position of the residents of Vrindavan. Paragraph. The Lord's devotees achieve their exalted position by unalloyed devotion and love. One cannot achieve such spiritual opulence by any puffed up material process of personal improvement. In Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Krishna book, Srila Prabhupada reveals the mind of Brahma as follows, quote, But if I am not so fortunate as to take birth within the forest of Vrindavan, I beg to be allowed to take birth outside the immediate area of Vrindavan, so that when the devotees go out, they walk over me. Even that would be a great fortune for me. I am just aspiring for a birth in which I will be smeared by the dust of the devotee's feet. Uh, just a comment, and then we'll go to the commentaries. Um, one of the Brahma Samhita verses starts, Chintam and Prakada Sadma Sukalpa Briksha. So it's explained that the spiritual world is like things here are made of bricks and wood and stone and metal and things like that, houses. There, everything is made of conscious chintamani stones. They're effulgent and they're conscious. Everything in the spiritual world is conscious. That's like hard to appreciate. There's a wall, there's a door, there's a kitchen sink. <laughs> and everything in the spiritual world that they have such things, but they're all conscious. It's hard to understand. It's not within our experience for sure. But everything is conscious. So take birth as a stone. That means stones are inanimate. But in the spiritual world, they're animate. Everything. They're conscious. It's a place of consciousness. Serving Krishna in different ways. So, commentary. Start with Vishwanath. Brahma is thinking this way. I have given up my control of the universe. I'm, he's Brahma and the quest for future liberation. But now, how can I get the dust of the feet of the inhabitants of Braja? Thinking thus, Brahma speaks with certainty. Let me have good fortune. May you be pleased to cast your merciful glance upon me. What is that good fortune? To be born as a blade of grass in Vrindavan. To be touched by the feet of your dear cowherd friends of Braja. Krishna's reply, Oh, Brahma. Give up such an unusual obsession <laughs> and pray for something more suitable for you. Brahma, then let me be born at the edge of Gokula, 
as a stone slab or piece of cloth to take the dust from the feet of one of your menial sweepers. Krishna, but Brahma, what is the reason for such glorification of the inhabitants of Braja? Do you not have shame as the worshipable creator of the universe to bathe in the dust of the lowly sweeper? Brahma, but they have taken their very life, t- taken as their very life, the most beautiful Bhagavan with a smile like a jasmine flower. Without you, they perish because they have such unprecedented love for you. You are their all in all, without which eating and drinking have no meaning even now. The Shrutis are searching for the dust from their feet without success. I should be more ashamed than the Vedas with my little prayers. O Lord, let it be. Previously, I prayed with Vaidhi Bhakti. Now I pray to be immersed in the ocean of the nectar of Raganuga Bhakti, having become the loyal follower of the inhabitants of Braja. So, for those of you that like to read Prabhupada's books, you know in Nectar Devotion, there's stages of practice of bhakti. One is the regulative stage, vaidhi. There are vidhis, the rules and regulations that followers of the bhakti process take up. So he's saying previously I was praying that way. Now I'm praying in the mood of a raganuga bhakti. So raganuga bhakti is the regulations you perform, and internally, there's hankering for the association of the perfected souls of Vrindavan. Those perfected souls, they're called Ragatmika, and he wants to be like them or get their mercy. So he's now following the Ragatmika devotees and following Raghunuga Bhakti. He's teaching us by his example how we can progress to that stage of bhakti. And here's an, a very interesting topic. It's in Jiva Goswami's commentary. Maybe you've read and been a little bit curious. We discussed, we touched on this the other day. But sometimes it is said in scriptures there's five kinds of liberation. Four of them are Vaishnava liberation. One of them is an impersonal liberation. And most people, when they hear liberation, they think of the impersonal one, Sayuja, or merging, like Agasura, merged into the body of Krishna. That's a, a kind of liberation. Or merge into the effulgence of Krishna, similar kind of Sayuja Mukti. But then there's four types of liberation that are Vaishnava liberations. Salokya, Mukti, achieving the planet of the Lord. Sarupya, Mukti, the inhabitants of Vaikuntha, they have forms like the Lord's, Sarupya. Sharsti and Samipya, they have opulences like the Lord. They have intimate association with him. So those are Vaishnava liberations. Now, sometimes it is said that the devotees of Krishna, if they're offered these kinds of liberations, they reject them. And that may be puzzling. If someone said, come on back to Godhead, you said, no, no thanks. What, it's, it's, it's perplexing. So here's an explanation. Jiva Goswami writes, Praising the great glory of the inhabitants of Vrindavan, Brahma develops humility and indicates that, being counted among them, he boldly desires service at their feet. Then he prays, greatly respecting the dust from the devotee's feet. The word iha or here indicates 
that he rejects the five types of liberation since they are unfavorable for service in braja. Meaning, the salokya, that's vaikuntha, sarupya, that's vaikuntha, and uh, sharsti, having opulences like the Lord, that's vaikuntha. The residents of Vaikuntha have opulences like the Lord. So they don't want to go to Vaikuntha. They want to be with Krishna and Vrindavan. They have, they see, they have some partiality, some unrestricted affection that was discussed in our morning classes after Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill and then put the hill back in place. The next chapter is going back home. The elders were, were going, who is he? He's not an ordinary person. An ordinary person can't lift a hill. And then not, not only that, he did this and he did that. He did the other things. Who is he? Nanda Maharaj, who is he? He's your son, but is he? What is he? So Nanda pacifies them. He repeats verse by verse the words that Gargamuni gave at the time of uh, the name-giving ceremony. Gargamuni did gave Krishna's name and, and spoke some verses and repeats the verses. Um, his, Krishna's position is in different, different, different births, he's appeared as avatar of this complexion. Because he says in different in, incarnations, he appeared as red, white, and yellow. And now he's blackish. So those that's the yuga avatars, according to the four yugas. But the, the original form of Krishna is the source of all those avatars. And Brahma is understanding it. He's the avatari, the source of all avatars. That's what he's expressing. And the residents of Vrindava, they just want to be with Krishna. They... they um, worship Narayan and they want to be with Krishna. Narayan is their Ishtadev, their worshipable deity. And Krishna is their dear most beloved friend, son, whatever, whatever the relationship is. They serve him in that in those moods. And that the mood is a mood of intimacy. No, they, they don't pay any attention to his divinity. We're going to be discussing that particular point in tomorrow morning's class because it came up a couple of times. My liberation is my birth in Braja, here. In Vaikuntha, there is Silokya, etc. Silokya, achieving the same planet. But in Mathura, there are forests, such as Gokula, where there is grass and dirt. There I can be covered in the dust from their feet with an internal desire for service to Krishna. Brahma wants a bath because he is greedy for perfection of all his limbs. Krishna, why do you not pray for birth as a cowherd directly? Instead of a blade of grass. Bhagavan, the life of the people of Gokul, is impossible to attain by one's own efforts since he is the supreme. He is attained as the giver of liberation Makunda, not the giver of Bhakti Yoga, but Krishna's devotion in Braja. Cannot. live for a moment without bhakti yoga. Thus the name Mukunda is uttered out of the greatest prema. How should I attain Krishna, who is so unapproachable by other methods and has prema, which is difficult to attain? Since you appeared, your foot dust is directly visible to the Upanishads now, 
how can one estimate the glory of that dust? Its glory has no end. Words cannot describe him, quoting the Upanishads. But it is not proper for me to pray for the dust of your feet to you, whose knowledge is rare even in the Vedas, which gives me all its knowledge. What to speak of praying to be born as a cowherd, endowed with prema, serving your lotus feet. The people of Braja have been praised for now five verses. How much more glory should Nanda and Yashoda have with the intention of praising Nanda and Yashoda because of shame and fear of his offense? His offense was the stealing the calves and the coward boys. He did not mention Krishna's friends in the beginning or Krishna's powers in making the forms of the boys. But he first spoke about the mothers who derived great bliss because of hiding the boys. So because of hiding the boys means when Brahma put the boys in the cave, Krishna manifests the form of boys. And for that one year, during the time that Brahma was gone one year past on earth, that the boys went back and now the mothers had the association of Krishna as their son, but looking just like their son. They didn't know the difference. What mother wouldn't know the difference between their son and the you know, likeness of their son? Not possible. Unless that likeness is Krishna. Uh, one more commentary and we're done for this evening. This is Sanatan Goswami who writes, With the desire for bhakti like that of the people of Braja, or with the desire to serve their lotus feet, Brahma now in five words rejects five items, including liberation which are in favor for this type of bhakti. With the word janma or birth, he rejects liberation. With the word iha or here, he rejects swarga or heaven. With the word kim api, he rejects being a brahmana. With the word atavyam in the forest, he rejects matura. With the word gokule, he rejects tapavan in other forests. Kimapi indicates he could be some low grass. That grass reaches perfection by being bathed in Krishna's foot dust from head to foot. Out of greed, bathing indicates that all his limbs should be successful. This dust is full of all holy places. Krishna's foot dust is sought but not attained by the Shrutis at the same time when he appears in this world. And then his conclusion. Krishna is the life of all beings in Gokula. They cannot live without him for even a moment. This indicates the highest prema. Question. Why should one pray to be born as some being among the inhabitants of Braja? Why not pray to be a cowherd directly? He alone is the life of all of them. It is unsuitable for me to pray for the dust of your feet, which is rare even for the Shrutis, which give all knowledge and are most ancient like me. What to speak of praying for birth as a cowherd who can control your lotus feet by their great prema? Now certainly there, uh, there, there's hankering. It's, it's not inappropriate to hanker for service to Krishna like the residents of Vrindavan. That's what Raghunuga Bhakti is. It's, there, there are, say it again, there's the term Ragatmika. Prabhupada named one of his disciples Ragatmika. She's a nice devotee. 
Rigatmika means those who are perfected souls. You could say, you know, the eternally liberated, perfected souls of Vrindavan. Like um, Mother Yasoda, she's an example. Or Radharani's brother, Sridham, and the other cowherd boys. These are the Rigatmika devotees. So the, the system of Raganuga Bhakti, supposing supposing someone has an attraction for parental affection. So that Ragatmika devotee for that mood is Mother Jasoda. There may be others. But so the, the devotee while doing their their duties, their cooking and this thing and that thing and the other thing, they do their religious duties. While doing their religious duties, their meditation goes to this Ragatmika devotee. They're thinking of her pastimes. Like, for example, they, we, we, we sing every Damodar month the Damodar Astaka prayers. And part of that is a meditation on the Ragatmika, Mother Jasoda, the flowers in her hair, how she's dressed, her smile, her singing her affectations, her ornaments. It's, it's stimulations for her particular type of ecstatic love by meditating upon her. It's not a meditation upon Krishna. At least some parts of it is this meditation upon her and her, her feelings of love and how she expresses her feelings of love. So externally, when, you know, I'm, I'm going about whatever I, go, I do, but I have this Affinity, you know, it's at a mature stage of bhakti for the love that Mother Jasoda has for Krishna. And this is the this is the process. This this is Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti. It's described in Nectar Devotion. So he's he's modeling it. It's it, it's taking Rupa Goswami's teachings, and here's an example of Rupa Goswami's teachings in the form of Lord Brahma, what he's doing. And by, by hearing it, it's stimulating our ecstatic love. We can, of course, we, we're covered. We're not so elevated. But the, 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 the potency, the spiritual potency is there in these narrations so that it cleanses and stimulates. It's not something that the mind, the mind is a very limited faculty. The mind cannot extend to transcendence. Nice verse in Brahma Samhita that says that. You can travel on a, a craft that goes the, the speed of the mind and transcendence is still far away. It's just another dimension. Another the spiritual energy can't be reached by the material energy. The mind can't extend to the realm of spirit. Still, by sound vibration, and when sound vibration enters the auditory sense, and its sound is spiritual, it carries, elevates, the, spiritualizes the mind to the point where one can connect with Krishna, not by understanding in a material way, like we might understand how to get the sound system to work when it's not working or which plug to plug it into and which cable to go to this thing, that thing. Those are material um, faculties that are useful in Krishna service. But to be able to perceive Krishna, that's something that requires something more than the mind. So in hearing these topics, it's not like, oh, I get it. You know, it's not that kind of, you plug it into this thing and plug into that thing. Okay, now it works. But it's not that kind of, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a different paradigm. It's a different way of awakening consciousness and understanding things uh, that are fully spiritual in nature. Just by what we're doing, hearing this is the Bhagavad Dharma process, hearing, chanting, remembering the name, form, qualities, pastimes, etc. of the personality of Godhead. That's a different process of acquiring knowledge. 
it's awakening knowledge of what we've forgotten through sound vibration, carrying consciousness to transcendence beyond the faculties of the mind. So if you can't understand all these things, that's, that's par for the course. You're doing just fine. It, that's not the in, in intent, is to understand all these things. The intent is to elevate consciousness, purify and elevate consciousness, so that the the sweetness of Krishna, the the the, the sense of the palpable sense of Krishna's presence through sound, is something you can experience. We have a long way to go, even with that. But that's that's the the paradigm. That's the approach. And when one has that connection with Krishna through sound, then everything that you need to know becomes known. The fullness of, of Vedic wisdom becomes known. That's what Brahma is saying. He, he manifests the Vedas. The Vedas are searching for the dust of the feet of Krishna, and he wants to get the dust of the feet of Krishna, which even the Vedas aren't able to reach. So his plan is, let me take birth as a blade of grass. And if I'm not eligible to take birth as a blade of grass in Vrindavan, then outside of Vrindavan. And just at last, there's a, a very similar expression that's referred to often. Um, here's a quiz question. Outside of Vrindavan, Outside of Vrindavan, who is the most, the, the dear most person to Krishna outside of Vrindavan? Starts with a U. Uddhava. Uddhava. <laughs> yes, Uddhava. He said? She said. She said. Uddhava. 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 So, it was Uddhava that was sent by Krishna to go to Vrindavan to deliver a message to the gopis, saying what he wanted to say in this letter. Then he read the letter to the gopis. And while he's reading, it's so many nice things, while he's reading the letter to the gopis, Radharani's over there in her mood of madness, saying, talks to the bumblebee. Very famous section. But Krishna sent Uddhava so that Uddhava could understand the exalted nature of the resident of Vrindavan. And that was the conclusion, because he's very intelligent. He's superlatively intelligent, like Brahma. So he could understand how exalted. And he, so he expresses that if I were to ask the gopis for the dust of their feet, they'd be too shy. They would just be embarrassed and run the other way and don't want to make them uncomfortable. But I want the dust from their feet. So he underwent austerities, long time, so that he could become a blade of grass. And when you go to Vrindavan, have you been to Vrindavan? No? Once? I have been several times. Once. Next time you go to Vrindavan, be sure you do parikrama around Govardhan Hill. And when your feet are like wasted and you're out there, you know, you're almost at the other end, but you're not there yet, you'll get to a place called Uddhava Kund. You're going up the western side of Govardhan, and it's on the right, because Govardhan is on your right. And there's a place, Uddhava Kund, where this wonderful pastime took place where that's where Uddhava became a blade of grass. And then there's, it's connected to, after Krishna left the planet, the queens of Vrindavan wanted to visit Vrindavan. The queens of Dwaraka wanted to visit Vrindavan. So they were taken there, and when they reached Govardhan Hill, they came to that same place that, Uddhava Kund, and they were advised, sing the glories of Krishna. And as they started singing the glories of Krishna, Uddhava came out of the blade of grass just to hear the 
singing the glories of Krishna. And then they realized how elevated is this place because <laughs> they knew Uddhava from Dwarka. So Uddhava also wanted to become a blade of grass. Brahma wanted to become also a blade of grass. These, the most intelligent people want the association of the residents of Vrindavan. You know, learned in the Vedas and all types of knowledge. Not, you know, um, something else. So many other things that intelligent people want. Build a spaceship to the moon or something. Or whatever. Whatever other people want. What do you think? You want to go to the moon? <laughs> really? <laughs> reading a book about Elon Musk. Reading a book about Elon Musk. Oh. And he's one of the Tesla Tesla founders. Yeah. He's building a spaceship. I know. <laughs> but are they going to the moon or where are they going? You just go out in space and take pictures, right? Not land on the moon. Is it going to be a moon landing? I don't know, but right now he's just trying to get into space. Right? Oh. Is that what it is? Yeah. Oh, and boy, I hit your button. That's what I was pointing you. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You want an electronic car, too? <laughs> <laughs> Tesla? Okay. You have to wait a while, though. <laughs> what color do you want? White or red? Blue? Orange. 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 <laughs> wow. <laughs> Got it all picked out. Okay. Well, Brahma is more intelligent than Elon Musk, and he, he wants... <laughs> yeah. he, he wants... He wants the dust of the feet of the residents of Vrindavan. Because he's, he's beyond, you know, going to the moon. He's created the whole universe, including the moon and everything else. And he can make as many of them as he wants. But that's not what he wants. That, that's what we're hearing. He, he, th this is the most intelligent person we, we, when we had this long class yesterday, it was a little complicated. The, of the 11 deities that preside over the senses, Brahma is one of them, and Brahma presides over the intelligence. Without Brahma, without the presiding deities, the senses can't do anything. Without Brahma getting the power from Krishna to empower your intelligence to understand anything you can understand. You can't understand anything. Intelligence is non-functioning. Not necessarily broken, but just not functioning. And he wants the dust of the feet. So it's, it's significant. And Uddhava, it's significant. And does it mean literally? It means literally because that the, the, the feet in Vedic culture, the feet are considered the lowest part of the body, not just because they're, you know, touching the ground and therefore not, not the same as the upper parts of the body, but it's not clean. So the, the, the feet are to be washed before entering a temple when you've been walking barefoot outside. The, so there's a foot wash commonly before entering a temple um, and so forth. So, but... They, when one wants the dust from the feet, those particles of dust from the feet of the resident of Vrindavan or just some dust in Vrindavan, Brajraj, the dust of Vrindavan, it's the spiritual world. It's all it's, um, spiritual potencies are there. And especially with the resident of Vrindavan, their love for Krishna is so strong. So just dust from their feet, please. That's his hankering. So let's see if there's some discussion. Yeah. For the people online. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj and again this is your third visit to our home <laughs> and we are very very fortunate even this difficult time we, we are we have you here so again thank you for first of all coming mm. and the question I have is um, uh, this position uh, uh, to, to have a desire to be the the, the the lowest part in Vrindavan, the subtle meaning is that the servant, the um, a service position should be yes. Yes. so humble that, yes. uh, you know, I'm, I'm nothing, right? The lowest. Uh, yes. Yes. Trinata Pisudi Chena. Same. Humility to the max. That's the meaning. It's, it's, it's a mood of humility and and wishing to be in service get mercy and to serve that's the mood and it's an, those that are uh, I just sent out there's this nice little um, exchange with Prabhupada one of his disciples was named Revati Nandana Revati Nandana and Revati Nandana was asking, saying to Prabhupada, you are more exalted than the Paramahamsa, which is the topmost stage of spiritual life. And Prabhupada said, no, no, I am lower than you. And, Prabhupada, and then Revati Nandana said, Prabhupada, you're beautiful. <laughs> you're, you know, you're in such an exalted position, and yet you're wanting to place yourself lowly below us and serve us. And then Prabhupada went on to say, <clears throat> I am lower than you. And he, then he con continued in that same mood. And then he said, if there's, if there's any credit to one who's so lowly, it's fulfilling the instruction of the spiritual master. And if one can fulfill the instruction of the spiritual master, then that person becomes glorious, even they may be lowly. Those aren't exactly his words, but that was the message. So it's very instructive. While feeling oneself lowly or tiny or small or not so significant, you know, spiritual humility, still wanting to be the instrument to carry out instructions, superiors' instructions, spiritual masters' instructions, and that makes one glorious. That's the gloriousness. Humil humility plus mercy make one glorious. Okay. Something else? Yeah, a follow-up question, right? So, um, the, the, the this uh, this humility, uh, people get the service, the, the the perfection in service. This the highest level of humility will increase the perfection in service. Then, who are the uh, individuals who get uh, the associates, become associates of Krishna, like? Uh, like their Krita Punya Punja. You know that phrase? No? Shukadev Goswami spoke the phrase and Prabhupada repeated it over and over and over and over. That is, um, he's speaking about the cowherd boys playing with Krishna and then he just goes into the swoon and says, who can say how these persons became cowherd boys? They must have been engaged in at pious activities for many, many lifetimes. But it's not pious, you know, material piety is spiritual merit. And with spiritual merit, <laughs> rock, scissors, and paper, that's what you're doing? <laughs> okay. With spiritual merit, then... Um, what, what 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 cannot be achieved? Anything can be achieved. So, something else. Um, Hare Krishna, Kumara. Uh, what is the uh, faculty of heart, and uh, what is the distinguishing between? Faculty of heart and the mind. Like. I've been asked this question many times. 
and I have a standard answer by now. <laughs> it means different things to different people. It's language. So it means the language, use of language can mean different things to different people. And commonly it does. So one way of making a distinction, one of the standard ways is um, the mind is that which receives information from the senses and it processes the information from the senses. And then there is an orientation of the mind according to the modes of nature. And the heart is more uh, the deep-seated, not the transient, but the deep-seated convictions and feelings of life, that which is most meaningful to you. So like, of the soul. Because, like we say, heart and soul. That's a common expression, heart and soul. So the soul is in the region of the heart, not the physical muscle, but in that region, it animating the body. And that's the place where the heart is, the heart, the, the, you know, the deep-seated feelings towards the orientation of deep feelings towards whatever it is that one has feelings for the soul's deepest convictions. That's hard. And the mind is processing things, information from the senses. Here's, a, here's an, an, another way, it's similar but somewhat different. Um, when we're, we're chanting, there's something the body does, something the mind does, and something the heart does. The body is, you know, the tongue and the lungs, and, you know, you, you make a sound and your ears are hearing the sound. That's, you know, body, you know, you know, good posture and stuff like that. Then the mind is the attentiveness to the mechanical thing that's being done. The body, the mind is our attentiveness being, you know, Hearing, the, the, the sense goes to the mind. Sense input, in, data, in, information goes to the mind. I was, um, the last day or two, I've been watching a, a video. It's a two-hour kirtan by Madhava in Radhadesh. They call it Radhadesh Mellows or something like that. They have a kirtan, 24-hour kirtan thing or whatever it is, once a year. So it's just in January this year. And for nearly an hour and a half, it was amazing. His eyes are closed for an hour and a half. His not senses aren't, his eyes aren't doing anything. It's, it's just his ears. And he's, I, I can only imagine what's going on in his mind. He's, he's immersed. His mind is immersed in the sound. That's the mind. But then you do that for a while and it starts to move the heart. The deeper feelings towards the object of that sound, that's Krishna. So that's the heart. Listen from your heart. But yeah, take a while to listen from your heart because you've got to get your... You know, the, the, the senses and the mind in order. But then align the senses and the mind with the heart. Okay? It can, again, it can mean different things to different people. So this is from uh, Radha Kunj Bihari Prabhu. Do living entities have the ability to reject the five types of liberation? Do they have the ability to? We have the ability, we have free will. Do living entities have free will? And uh, 
he rephrased the earlier question that he had asked yesterday about upadi. Um, as devotees, we are required to shed our upadis to realize our true identity. So um, now, when Krishna where Krishna loves to have relationships with devotees in different moods or different rasas. Isn't Nanda Maharaj thinking as that he is the father of Krishna and Upadi? No, because that's who he is. <laughs> in a spiritual sense, he's not the biological father, but in the spiritual sense, it's not an Upadi. Any more than Krishna is... The, the apadi of Krishna is that he's the son of Nanda Maharaj. Nanda, Nandana. That's an upadi. No. And uh, this is Atulya Mataji's question, similar to Sham Prabhu's question here. What would it mean to me um, to be a dust of dust or grass in Rindavan? What does it mean? For me. For you. It means lots of humility. <laughs> That's what it means. <laughs> and you get mercy. It's these two things. Humility and mercy. Submission and, and mercy. That's what it means. This Hema Surya Vanshi Mataji. How to understand and follow humility? If I think that I'm insignificant, lower than everyone, not I'm not resonating with it much. How to deeply follow and get Humble attitude. Well, it, first of all, real humility isn't just feeling lowly. Real humility is a spiritual conception that says, I'm very tiny. I'm this tiny spark of Krishna's fullness. Tiny in that sense, not lowly, like low self-esteem kind of tiny. Not that. And in the, in, the, in the grand picture of everything, how significant am I? Quite insignificant. But the good news is um, there's intrinsic worth within me because I'm part of the supreme, lovable personality of Godhead, source of everything, Krishna. That's my intrinsic worth. And one can bask in the in the the joy of that intrinsic worth and that spiritual humility. So how to cultivate it is you know purification of consciousness. Hear and chant and remember to 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 engage cleansing of the senses and practical activities of devotional service. She likes to cook and bake. So cook and bake for Krishna. <laughs> and they get into that consciousness. I have a question. You do. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand of sense objects from yesterday. Distinction between senses and sense objects? Yeah, I mean, distinction, I'm not really getting clear what does a sense object mean. Well, I suggest that you read carefully a few times uh, that section that we read yesterday evening, the Sankhya philosophy section. But it's, it's what it's... There's a... Um, just like the... How to say this properly? There, just like there's subtle senses and then the sense organ. Let's say the power of locomotion and legs. Supposing you lose your legs, they get amputated or something. You still have power of locomotion. You can find a way to get from here to there by power of locomotion. So there's the, there's the, um, there's the sense and there's the sense organ. So there's a distinct, this, we can say subtle sense and the sense organ gross or physical or phenomenal sense organ. So then sense objects, 
there's also the subtle sense object and then there's the gross sense object. Gross comes from subtle. This is Sankhya. Gross comes from subtle. So the sense objects are subtle in the Sankhya system. And then from the subtle comes the gross. It's just like from the universal form comes stuff, comes the universe. But who's seen the universal form? You know, Arjuna saw, Mother DeSoto saw, but it's subtle. It's a form of Krishna, but it's not perceivable with these senses unless Krishna permits one to see. And But there, it, it exists. So sense objects are subtle. And then from the subtle comes the gross. And that's what Brahma does. Brahma takes the 24, the Sankhya things, because that's what Vishnu does. He creates the, the ingredients and Brahma puts them together. So Brahma knows how to make the subtle into gross and voila. You know, we, we don't know how to do the voila thing. <laughs> <laughs> But he does. He's like really intelligent and he's empowered to do it. But it's not like, you know, going to the, the Ford Motor plant and you know, putting the car together and then off the, the, you drive the car away. It's not like that. It's subtle to gross. And then, so, but it, one can also say sense objects. Like, you know, it, 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 it snowed the other day. <laughs> you can see, it feels cold and you can see the snow. And so the, the senses, the sense of touch and the sense of sight and so forth. So those are, the, when, the, the sense objects are out there in the gross form, but they're, they exist because of the subtle form. That's the point I want to make. Sankhya is in this subtle realm. And mixing it makes all the gross stuff. So anything is anything we see is a sense objects, grosser sense objects. Like let's say sound. That's a sense object. I, the sound in ether. Like it's pretty, it's it's a little mysterious. From the anyway, I'm giving a sankhya class because you're asking a sankhya question. It's a little complicated. It's it's there's sky when we look. You know, I'm looking out the window and it's, the sun hasn't set yet, so there's the sky. Or even at night, the night sky, <clears throat> and that's gross. But the the sky and the sound that's within ether is subtle and it has this gross manifestation. Like, you know, right now we're sitting here in the living room and there's all kinds of signals passing through the room right now. You know, we, we're, we don't have the receiver but there's sound passing through the room. There's all kinds of TV, radio, and this and that. And if you have your cell phone on, or someone calls your cell phone, it's going to ring. And then you hear ring. It's all, but it, there's signals. So there's sound in in ether right now. It's like we don't perceive it. You have to have the proper receiver. Anyway. So this is from uh, Sri Radhika Mataji. Just now you explained the alignment of the heart and mind during chanting. Yesterday you spoke about how the gross elements come from subtle. Yes. Even before the body is created, false ego exists. Yes. To use the cliche, we are starting on the wrong foot. We're doing what? We are starting on the wrong foot. Well, we wanted it. So, how does one properly align this oldest of friends, false ego, during chanting? Perhaps my more fundamental question is, 
whether there is a difference between aligning the mind during chanting and false ego. Yes, there is a distinction. They're not the same. But, you know, the alignment is the true ego. That is, being the, in the mood, in the mood, this is the heart level, being in the mood of being a servant of the name. That's at the heart level. And that takes care of our dear friend, false ego. It's like, you know, be quiet. <laughs> You can you have you have you can sit over there and just behave yourself. <laughs> well, I'm going to serve Krishna, and then like you know th there will be some complaints. Rah, 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 rah. You got to serve me. Sorry, I'm going to serve Krishna. So it's it, it's by the commitment to be the servant of Krishna, servant of the name, and that's how the the alignment of the false ego is like. to the side. Okay? Kasturi Manjari Mataji's first question. Um, can one hanker to serve a Raghatmika Bhakta at any stage, even at a neophyte level, when one has no understanding of one's Swarupa? How is that possible? The short answer is, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Go ahead. And the second question, a small qu clarification. Are the Gopa friends of Krishna Nitya Siddhas? If they are Nitya Siddhas, then how to understand Krita Punya Punja? Well, some are, some are getting trained. This is Sri Hari, Vrajeshwari Pranamathaji's son. Mm. Did Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, um, who were they in their previous life? They're Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda. They didn't have a previous life. They're eternal. They're Shakti Tattva. They're not Jiva Tattva. Living entities are Jivas, and they're Shaktis. They're just eternally mother and father of Krishna. Interesting, <clears throat> there's a section, um, Drona and Dara. It's a long, not too easy to understand, but it's directly in the verses of the Bhagavatam, spoken by Shukadeva Goswami. There, these are personalities who aspired for the position of the parents, mother, father of the Supreme Lord. So their partial expansions became part of the mother and father of Krishna. And after Krishna's departure, they returned to their abode. It's high technology. It's very not easy to understand. Go ahead. This is uh, Amrita Keli Mataji. Uh, we see that Lord Brahma has offended the Brajavasis and Krishna by kidnapping the cowherd boys and calves. But did not do what? By kidnapping. By kidnapping, okay. Mm -hmm. But because of his act, elder gopis and the cows were able to have Krishna as their child for one year. Yeah. Which is a great favor or blessing for them. Yes. So, does Lord Brahma still have to go through the punishment? Do we understand this as Krishna fulfilling multiple objectives with one action? It is, the last question is yes, multiple objectives through one action. And uh, yes, the, 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 what he did was not right. Krishna inspired him to do it, so it's not the same culpability of, as if he just, you know, went off and kidnapped somebody. But um, it wasn't right, and he recognized that it wasn't right. So we hear what did after he left, he circumambulated Krishna and went. It's, we sometimes say he went back to Brahmaloka. That's what I said this morning. 
But in, in Navadvip Dhammahatmya, he went to undergo austerities for his wrongdoing. And after long austerities, then the form of Goranga came before him. And he, Branga said, you were pleased me very much by your austerities, and I want you to know that you'll take part in my pastimes when I appear. And then Brahma said, you're very merciful, but I, I don't want to make the same mistake again, so please give me this opportunity to serve you from a very humble position. So Lord Chaitanya said, yes, you can be Haridas Thakur. So that's our, our Gaudiya understanding, at least, of that Haridas Thakur is a combined present appearance of Lord Brahma and Prahlad Maharaj. Okay. Sri Hari has a follow-up question about Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda. So, if they are eternal, always the father and mother of Krishna, are there any other pastimes of them other than this Vrindavan pastimes that we hear? They don't want to be anywhere else but Vrindavan. They want to be with Krishna, Vrindavan, Bas. So, this is Kasturi Manjari Mataji again. Uh, clarification. The Vrajavasis and... <clears throat> Pure devotees are always engaged in serving Krishna and we hear that pure devotee senses are completely controlled by Krishna. Does that mean the demigods or presiding deities of the senses have no role to play over yes, pure devotees? that's what it means. Then this is Sri Radhika Mataji question. You said that the false ego is affected by the three modes. What is the distinction between how I misidentify myself in the three modes? So in other words, when my false ego is affected by sattva, rajas and tamas, what is the external manifestation of my misidentification? Well, you know, you know what the three modes are. And you, you, so the, 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 the essence of false ego is mistaken identity. We accept something that we're not for being something that we are. And then the mistaken identity can be more in the mode of goodness, more in the mode of passion, more in the mode of ignorance. So there's personality features or personality types that are of those modes. And this is from Radha Kunjabihari Prabhu. Is Uddhava's desire to be born as a blade of grass in Vrindavan an example Okay, same similar example of serving as servant of servant of servant. Yeah, yes. Yamanaji, Prabhu's okay. question. How, how long is the list? Uh, Almost done. Okay, good. Time and again in Srimad Bhagavatam, we encounter either beautiful instructions or beautiful prayers of Lord Brahma. Second canto, third, five, fifth, seven, eight, etc. Yet, these prayers seem to be exceptional and carry the deepest, lofty truths. If this is true, how or why this is so? Well, he's in Vrindavan. Go, go visit Vrindavan and you, what, you'll feel something. <laughs> he's visited Vrindavan and he's feeling uplifted. He's, he's with Krishna in Vrindavan. And seeing the cowherd boys and the cows and the resident of Vrindavan, his consciousness is lifted. Special. So we're done. You have any comments here? Any thoughts? No? You sure? Can I ask you a question? Pass him the microphone. I'd like to hear from you what, whatever, uh, something that's particularly outstanding that you heard about Brahma that you're going to remember from this discussion. Something that you heard about Brahma that you're going to remember from this discussion.
He's thinking. Humility. He wanted to become a blade of grass to catch the dust from the gopi's feet. You know the three Okay. You let me know later. Okay? Okay, we're done. Thank you very much, Prabhupada Ki Zai.